The following interview was conducted with Barbara G. Doster, uh, university retiree and director of undergraduate programs for the Craner School of Management for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Tuesday, July 27, 2010 in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Also sitting in is her husband, home. and welcome. Thank you very much. Thank okay. you. Let's start out. Tell us what, where and when you were born and your parents in early years. Well, I was born in Columbus, Ohio at Mount Carmel Hospital where mothers stayed two weeks after having babies. <laughs> and that was January 7th, 1934. And my parents were role models for me. Um, mother worked at the Children's Hospital on a volunteer basis, actually putting in gumball machines all over Columbus. Dad was a member of Lions, a Chamber of Commerce. He was head of that for a while. He worked for Ohio Bell his whole career, got the gold watch at 40 years. But one of the outstanding things Dad did every weekend, I can remember him heading downtown in his work clothes, and he and a, a black minister were refurbishing an old fire station so that young people could take secretarial skills, mechanics, those kinds of things. In that facility. And this was way, way back when, in the 50s probably, that Dad did this. But it was always better to give than to receive. Mom was scotch with the money, and he came home one night without his overcoat in the winter. Phil, where's your overcoat? A man at Broad and High needed it more than I did. And that was it. That's, That's right. the way things happened at sure. our house. What was grade school like? Was it? Grade school was uh, in portable buildings. These were wooden buildings with a big, big stove in the center. Uh, there were about 75 of us, grades one through six, and uh, had the pleasure of seeing two Glenmont. Well, four classrooms? Four classrooms, Two that's grades, right, okay. and a cafeteria, one bathroom, and you had to run outside to go to the middle portable if you chose to use the bathroom. Um, and I remember teachers. I remember as a second grader being a tall girl, even in second grade, the principal, who was also a second grade teacher, said, Barbara, would you take care of the class? I have to run down to Portable 3. And I said, oh, yes, Mrs. Jones. What shall I do? Just keep everyone quiet. Well, that was a first responsibility in school, and uh, I evidently did all I right. I passed the test. <laughs> passed the test for that. But those were good years, and, of course, we walked to school, and it was about a mile, and walked home, and... Uh, big thing was playground as well as learning right, yeah. but okay, those were then happy times. Also about high school and also the recent reunion. That oh yes. North High School uh, closed in 1976 but has been used as an education center and a school for high school students whose buildings are being renovated. So, so still it's be. still in very good shape uh, I think. And I went there from 1949, 10th grade, and graduated in 1952. And as I uh, had indicated, I was a mid-year student. That meant I started 1B at Glenmont in January because of my birth date. And, and I graduated in January 1952. And that was different. The classes, our class was smaller than the June class. And I thought until I reread the, the yearbook that we didn't have as much responsibility, but I read through the things that I'd been involved in. I was on student court and student council and president of Latin club and president of book club and all kinds of things. And uh, I can remember uh, good times there because we always had athletics, we always had art and music, and those were things that I loved and I participated in. A uh, couple of stories. Uh, we were going to do our Miss Brooks, 
and I just could close my eyes and imagine being Miss Brooks. So I tried out, and I wasn't chosen. Another Barbara was. I was chosen student director, and student director in that day and age meant all the nitty gritty. You did all the little jobs, never got on stage but did all the little jobs. The so behind the scenes. Behind the scenes. So I, I was all right. Never got on stage until 4th of July 2010. And I was invited to apply, send in an application for the North High Polar Bear Hall of Fame. And I was selected uh, three men and I were selected to receive this honor this year and it was on stage sat on stage talked from the microphone on stage and I told the audience this and they all clapped they they were with me as I told some uh, stories let me just tell a couple girls athletic association was a big thing every girl wanted to be in it well, I could play sports, and you'd think I'd be good, but I never made the class team where you had lots of points. So I found out that if I bicycled and hiked up the River Road, Olentangy River Road and Scioto River Road, I could amass enough points to be a member. And last semester, senior year, I became a member of GAA. What a my good My goal feeling. was reached, right? Perseverance is the word I used in my remarks on the July 4th. I also wanted to be in the choir at North High School. Every semester I'd try out. And Miss Ross, who worked with Fred Waring, and I don't know how she ended up, but she ended up at North High School, would say, no, Barbara, not this semester. Finally, fall of 1951, tried out for the last possible time. She said, all right, Barbara, you may be in choir this, your last semester, but please mouth the words for many of the songs. I said, oh yes, Miss Ross. Thank you, Miss Ross. You're a very gracious lady. <laughs> I Sorry, finally made it. That's pretty good. <laughs> but I graduated uh, at the top of the class. Uh, young man and I were both honored, uh, and I was valedictorian. And so I studied hard. I was a straight-A student through school. It just meant you did your work and went to class. And, and you were still active in activities. So. Oh, yes. Right. 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 Yes, the, the activities were important in my life, and the friends were important. And I learned at North a lot about teamwork, that it's a lot easier to work on a project as a team than to go it alone. And those, some of those high school lessons carry still today with me. Right, exactly. And that's, it's surprising, but, but they're still there. Right, yeah. And that's why uh, the honor was just so well received. And they have a choir, an alumni choir, that was singing, and the choir director motioned to me to come on up <laughs> and sing on the fourth. <laughs> and the Battle Hymn of the Republic, I could, I was allowed I to end. sing it. <laughs> so that was that was fun. I do want to say uh, one thing. Uh, the first White Castle ever was at the bottom of the street where the school was. And uh, some days, a crowd of us girls walked home, and we'd stop at the White Castle for a dime and get a slider. We'd go on to the BA, the bowling alley, never bowled but just you know, mingled with all the high school kids. Then walked a little, well, probably another mile and stopped at Jack Horner's Corners for a nickel cherry Coke. And then I was the furthest north, so all we'd let each girl off and then I'd, I'd hike the last half mile. But those were good memories. That's right. So you, walk, you, you were in walking distance of school, you walked? Well, or I usually took the bus, oh, okay. but many times, especially when the crowd was walking, sure, right. okay. you walked. And I was probably four miles from school, of yeah. course, all uphill. Right. <laughs> Very good. That's nice. Then good. Uh, come, tell us about college life. 
Ohio State. Well, I was a Columbus girl, and I thought maybe Denison or Ohio Wesleyan would be nice. But Ohio State was $445 a quarter. That meant about $150 for your year of college. I lived at home except for two quarters at the sorority. And Dad took me to campus, handed me a dollar, and that was for my lunch and my supper. So it was the best thing to do. Right. And I'd had a grandmother who'd graduated in 1897 and a father who graduated in 1929. So there were good reasons right. to choose Ohio State. And I became active. Right away, uh, I uh, was secretary of the Commerce College Council. My degree was in business with an advertising sequence. I was secretary of the sophomore class, which was an all-campus election. And I was in women's self-government, and I was in Panhellenic. And then we had three honoraries. There were women's honoraries and men's honoraries back in 52 to 56. Uh, Mears was the sophomore women's honorary, Chimes the junior women's honorary, and Mortarboard was the senior women's honorary. And I was fortunate enough to be selected to uh, each one of those in those years. But my main focus was student government. I started out as a freshman where you used to make copies by having someone turn the wheel. Oh, yes. So I turned the wheel for many, many hours and was elected secretary when I was a sophomore. No, sophomore secretary and then secretary. There were 10 sophomore secretaries. Then I was elected secretary my junior year. And spring of my junior year, I was elected president of student senate. And there hadn't been a woman president. So here I was, breaking the glass ceiling back then. Wonderful. And that was just a wonderful experience because, again, I had a team. I had Don Jones, the vice president. I had the secretary, Elaine Krauss, and Norm Schwartz, the treasurer. I had all the sophomore secretaries. And they were enthusiastic participants in activities. So I, because of being president, I ended up on the Council on Student Affairs. There were four students and then faculty and sure. administrators, and Bland Stradley was the uh, vice president of the Student Affairs. And I can remember one of the meetings that we had, and he smoked a great big cigar and would go, oh, oh, meeting come to order. And he said, I want to change the name of this university. And, you know, we all, he wants to change the name. What does he want to call it? I proclaim that this university will be the Ohio State University from this day forward. And it is. <laughs> but I can just remember right, yeah, him Matthew. proclaiming that. And, and it held. Right. President Beavis evidently agreed with him. And, that's where it, it was. Helps. That's what it is. That's right. Exactly. But then I had uh, quite an honor when I graduated. They chose one male and one female as outstanding senior woman and senior man, and I was chosen oh, nice. out of our nice. graduating classes. Very nice. Outstanding senior woman, and I, I, I thanked oh, everyone because they, they, we all work together, and that's that's the key, and we. The other word, as I said earlier, is persevere. Nothing happens if you're just sitting. That's right. You need to be active. Moving forward. That's right. That's right. Then what came next? Did you meet, were you, you met your husband there? I met my husband. That's a, a story I'll share. We were both counselors. Well, I. Oh, he was at Ohio State as well. He was at Ohio State in agriculture. And uh, my girlfriends and I, always went to the Ohio State Fair looking for farm boys. 
we just thought farm boys, being city girls, we thought farm boys were interesting. Well, the spring uh, of my junior year, no, my sophomore year, I met Howard. He doesn't remember that because he had this pretty little Joanne that he was talking to that weekend. We were both at a camp. But the fall of my junior year, his senior year, we were at Camp Mary Orton, north of Columbus, at a freshman camp for the week before school started. And I met Howard. Now, I was a counselor, of course, with young women, and he was over with a cabin full of young men. And we started visiting and just enjoyed visiting with each other and decided to take a walk in the woods. And we took a walk in the woods, not having looked at the schedule, and we came up out of the woods. Here were all the young men meeting with the dean of students on the grass right there at the edge of the woods, and all of the young women meeting with the dean of women. And there we walked up. I quickly moved over to the women's group, and he quickly moved over. But that was the beginning. Sure. He didn't ask me out. Uh, his fraternity fellows would come to the trial house and say, oh, yeah, Howard is going to call you. I said, well, he hasn't called yet. He dated 17 young women that fall quarter, and on in December called and asked me out. Well, I was busy. I Getting ready for Santa. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Something I like just, that. I just couldn't work him in, but I said, Thursday night I have a foot doctor appointment, and you could take me to that if you'd like to, because I was going to take the streetcar. And <laughs> he picked me up and took me to the foot doctor. Never dated anyone else. And that was... He volunteered for the draft and was drafted into the Navy, so he graduated. I still had my student senate responsibilities for my senior year, but I took a week off school in February because we thought he was going to the Pacific. No war. It was after Korea okay. and before Vietnam. But we thought he was heading out. We were planning June, but we moved it up to February, and it was wonderful. I had about 500 friends who showed up because... People were all in school, and I said to the professors, I'm going to be gone next week on my honeymoon. And they called you Miss Gibbs, was my, they never called you by your first name. And you never wore trousers, you always wore skirts in class. And uh, I came back, and the professors all made a big deal of introducing Mrs. Doster to the class. So, so I finished college. There was no question. They said, aren't you going with Howard? I said, my goodness, no. I'm president of the Senate. I have two Respond. quarters to finish. No. no that, we just got married. That's, we'll that's, work on that afterwards. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that was, those were good times. And then I moved into, uh, I, I did, I was a bank teller and uh, worked at a, a junkyard in Norfolk, Virginia, but also we had our firstborn. And I don't know whether this is appropriate or not, but I had said to Howard before we were married, I was sorry I couldn't have children. And if he wanted out of the contract, that was fine right. with me. And by the time we had our fourth one, he said, Barbara, what about this not having children? Could we talk about that? Right? <laughs> <laughs> but we had uh, uh, David in Norfolk, Virginia, and uh, David's 53 now, and Dan came along, and he'll be 52 in December, and Susan's 47, and youngest Anne is 45, and we have eight grandchildren, and they all have wonderful loved ones that we, we care about Do as Do they well. live close to where you are? Uh, Anne, the youngest, with her two boys, 12 and 14, and her husband Travis are down the road from us oh, in nice. Ohio. Uh, uh, daughter Anne is an artist, and she's in our home here. And she just completed a portrait of me that's hanging in the Barbara G. Doster undergraduate conference room in Cranard. 
and it's to just I want to go over and, see, and it. see it right. today. But raising four children included all the things that mothers do. Uh, I just seemed to join everything. I had a nursery school at the church down when we lived down at the farm in Harveysburg, and. You know, I was president of Athletic Boosters, president of PTA, a church deacon, a Sunday school teacher, a Cub Scout leader, a Girl Scout leader, Athletic Boosters president, music boosters, 4-H bear, board, and of course, homeroom mom. And uh, uh, the thing that we encouraged, of course, with our children was education, and their spouses and loved ones and our children have 17 college degrees so they all have master's degrees very good let's talk a little bit about Purdue how in the Craner how that came about and how you Howard finished his PhD I always teased him it took him 17 years to get out of college <laughs> he did other things like earning a living for the four for the children family, and, right? I, and uh, myself uh, but we, uh, after he finished his Ph.D. in the was fall... Was this stayed out at Ohio State? Is that where at Ohio out? State. Okay, uh-huh. okay, so you were living in the Columbus area. Living okay. in Columbus, and uh, <clears throat> let's see, that was in fall of 67 that you interviewed for the job after Ph.D., because he knew he would be finished with it that fall quarter, and interviewed at Washington State University out at Pullman, Washington, and Purdue University, West Lafayette, Indiana, and said yes to Purdue. And we, uh, he came out several times in this, that summer before we moved in January 1st, 1968, and he'd hunt for houses and never could quite find a house that he thought I'd approve of, but he finally found one on Maryland Avenue, and my mother and I jumped in the car to come over and check it out, and there were only three bedrooms, and we had four children, and just, no, that's not right. That's not, we just vetoed it. So we moved into a rental property up on Windsor, and I started house hunting. The two boys were in school, two little girls in the back seat. Drawing found a house in March out on seven acres and it was a wonderful place for children out in the county off Morehouse Road. We raised the children, raised five acres of strawberries and that taught them business skills, uh, organizing a, a business, managing the money, managing their friends who were their employees. Some of them had to be let go, so they very good experience. <laughs> learned you didn't play in the berries. Right. But but we came and Howard was in extension and uh, we had a satisfying time. The children all showed hogs in the four H okay. County nice. Fair here in Tippecanoe County. Grandfather and grandmother would bring twenty hogs in May from Ohio and they would first night that we had the first load of hogs Howard came home from the office and the children were all sitting at the supper table and he said have you fed and watered the hogs no we haven't fed and watered the hogs you don't eat your own supper until you've fed and watered the hogs and those (laughs) never had to be told again Never told again, so it it stuck. Right. So that was that was a good. But those years, uh, child raising years, Howard in extension work, uh, traveling all, yeah, all saying, over. Right. Were busy years. Uh, I was supportive of the children. I did have a part time job working for a, a professor in ag econ, which was going out to farmers and getting questionnaires filled out. And uh, I think that's the only part-time for pay work that I did. The other was volunteer. Right. 
work, and it was. Right. Well, tell us a little about the uh, the Craner, how that what that, that was a a fun story, I think. I had been taking art classes. In fact, I have 60 credit hours of art from Purdue because I love art. Don't practice very much, but I love it. And uh, I was really looking for something to do outside of the home because at this point uh, we had the daughters 13 and 15 in junior high and high school, the boys in college. So I wasn't needed to be at the That's door time, right. every every night as they came off the school bus. So I was trying to figure out what what's next. Well, Howard came home from work one day and said, there's a job for you at Cranard. They have posted academic advisor for the School of Management. And of course, management and Aggie kind of share the Cranard building. So he had seen this, said, apply. I said, oh, I don't have any qualifications. I, I've just done mother things, activity things before that in college and high school. Well, he went down to Mary Welch and said, don't make a hiring decision till you've met my wife. I was so embarrassed. I can't face her. Oh, Howard, I can't. I'm a, oh, I just can't go in and face Mary. Well, I did. I called, made an appointment, and went in, and of course heard about academic advising. Met with Dick Walbaum and Bob Dillingham, who were all the professionals there, as well as other advisors. And Dick Walbaum said, because it was a part-time job. It wasn't even full-time. He said, now, Barbara, you do know that there's no career ladder here. It's academic advisor. I said, oh, that's fine, Dick. I pay you to let me work here. <laughs> <laughs> this modest sum that I was getting anyway. Right. And it, it was 1977, and I was accepted as the academic advisor and uh, worked part-time for three years, then full-time, and had three wonderful faculty members who oversaw the undergraduate area. Uh, Chuck Lawrence, he was just tremendous, very, he's an accountant, was an accountant and very organized, and I liked that. Then Glenn Hickel, and I've always, he was an economics professor, and I will always called him a renaissance man. He would come in the office when we're, there were issues, you know, faculty wanted us to do something, sure. and we were there at the pleasure of the faculty. Right. And uh, Glenn would come in, close my office door, and say, Barbara, we need to discuss and we try to pull out all the positives and negatives. Then we'd go to the staff, and of course they'd have more to put on. So he was just an outstanding person to work for, and I ran the office. I ran the ship, and I appreciated that. He was certainly available, but not, okay. not needing to be hands-on. And then the last gentleman is a special friend, Jack Hatcher, an accounting professor. And uh, he, he was hands off too, but we'd still have meetings. Now Chuck Lawrence and I, I don't drink coffee, but I drank lots of coffee with Chuck <laughs> over in the union because we just had to talk things out to the nth degree. But Jack and I uh, had kind of the same personality, I would think. It was, you know, we both appreciated the other's ideas. And so we started things like the scholarship reception. Uh, 
there was group registration when we had more students than we could handle, we advisors could handle as individuals. I had ended up having 11 advisors, three secretarial staff, and uh, student help always. And I remember Sonia Wise one day on campus, to, we always had us all introduce. I had the people introduce themselves. And she said, we're a team. And we, we were a team. Right. And one of the good things Jack and I did was hire Eric Props. I, that young man's in a wheelchair right. from an accident during college. And Eric always made my day. He'd be there before 8 in the mornings. And I'd say, oh, I've got to get something over at the registrar. No problem, Barb, I'll run over. Well, run over meant wheel over. And he's now in charge of the career center for the undergraduates in the School of Management. But just those are the kinds of people that we had. And it, uh, I only had one not so fun thing. I uh, won't say her name, but uh, when each of us got computers on our desks to do the registration of the students. We didn't need our computer operator anymore. And I tried to get her to be the receptionist or the secretary to the career person. She wanted to be a computer operator. So I wasn't able to solve that one sure. to everyone's satisfaction, right. but she went on and found another spot on campus. Let's um, talk about Bacata, the advising that... Oh, Bacata, Purdue Academic Advising Association. And in the 1970s, John Bothell uh, from engineering, no, John Bothell from pharmacy, he was an academic advisor, was right. pharmacy, right. Uh, had gone to a national academic advising association and it was over in the East, and he was excited. So he brought the idea back, and Alan Welch and a couple of women from the liberal arts area and myself and Rex Fadre in science and John sat down, John's idea, and added our ideas and organized the Purdue Academic Advising Association. And that's still healthy and that was in the 80s right. and uh, there were honors because of that it's now called the Richard McDowell who was in oh was that right I didn't realize Richard that. McDowell McDowell outstanding academic advisor award that's selected every year and I was honored with that a couple of times uh -huh. and then I received the national academic advising outstanding advisor award and I also was able to represent universities on the board of okay. the national organization. And that was a good experience, sure. right. uh, meeting people from all over the country. Right. It's now grown to a membership of 6,000. So it's a national? It's a national organization. Was, and then you started the, the chapter here. And we started a chapter here. There's a chapter at Ohio State. There's several local university right. chapters. Right. But it was, it, what it did was gave us a forum with Picada to discuss as advisors some situations that we needed solutions right. to. And it's your own group. It was it's our similar, own group, similar. and we were all facing uh, the student who needed our help. And of course, now I understand they enter their own schedules, but we were the the entrance, right. The enter yeah. people right. at right. that time. So yeah. it was it was a good thing. The Barbara Doster Leadership Forum, did you start that? No, I right. didn't start it. Uh, I had a wonderful group of students. I was advisor because of the position of director to the School of Management uh -huh. Council. And uh, the group that was on council wanted to do something with regard to leadership and they had very precise goals they wanted a hundred sophomores and juniors in management to be selected 
to apply for the opportunity to spend a weekend together with 20 corporates. Now the corporates would pay $2,000, $2,500 for the weekend. The students would pay $35 because wanted them to be sure to realize this was serious. You don't just not attend. And then they wanted it to be held out of town. Go to Indianapolis by bus so that students couldn't run off to see the girlfriend or the boyfriend or interrupt the session right. by something that they felt they needed to do on campus. Our dean didn't think going off campus was a good idea, but, you know, the expense and you know, have students in Indianapolis out of control, but it worked wonderfully. And January 99 was the first Barbara G. Doster Leadership Forum. Now, it was just called Leadership Forum in all that preparation, and the students wanted to present it to the alumni, the Cranard Alumni Organization. We had an alumni of probably 50 or 60 members. And uh, the, the alums were meeting that fall, and the students were ready to present. And I was, they were just wonderful. The student presentation was top notch. We got their idea, teaching leadership skills. They wanted it to be team based. They wanted corporates to be team leaders, two corporates with each group of 10 students. And this was just a very brand new idea. The last picture of their slideshow as they presented it to the alums was my picture. And I looked down and I hadn't heard about this. What, what's my picture up there for? And the student said, we want this to be known as the Barbara G. Doster Leadership Forum. And it yeah. was. And I just appreciated it so much. And it's continuing. As I uh, noted, it's the seventh, because it's biennial. Right. It's the seventh will be held in January in well, Indianapolis. And uh, they, they're in the midst of planning. Sure. And they even have the chairperson for the thir 2013 selected. Oh my so God. they have two years or more to meet as a committee and get new ideas. Right. Uh, two interesting we have to watch two. You have to watch the time because there's, what I got this far now, and you got somebody coming. Okay. In. A uh, quick story on uh, what happens. Uh, Saturday night we go to IUPUI and they have all kinds of, in the gym there, physical contests. And they've got team t-shirts and they go all out. That's a big thing, but Sunday noon, after the teams have wound up, there's a luncheon. And the gentleman, whose name escapes me, who was the a butler in England, and he now teaches oh, in the Westwood. Consumer and Family Science. Oh, okay. Yeah, I forget, but you can But he that. gives, uh, does the luncheon and tells us sure. which manners are appropriate and tells, of course, the funny story of the man tucking the tablecloth into his belt and then standing up. So we, <laughs> we have a good time, and the students learn. Sure. They learn. Yeah. Let's so... Uh, the uh, couple other things, the awards. Talk. You you mentioned some of the awards, but the one I wanted to ask you about was the special boilermaker. That was a nice producing, and you mentioned in the text we've got the other awards that you got. Yes, yeah. and the special boilermaker was a surprise. Glenn Hickel nominated me, and it was special because there you are at a football game, right down and there. I saw it as a service award, and I received the Cranert Service sure. Alumni Service Award as I retired, uh, you know, trying to do the right things at the right time. And I can't remember a day I was not excited 
to go to the basement of Craig. Uh, that it was just students are energizing. Anyone who gets the privilege of working at a university, no matter what the position, the students energize right, you. Exactly. And I, it was just, you know, you remember so many funny things. The young man transferred in 21, no, 31 credit hours from AP tests and things he'd done before college. So he became a sophomore instead of a freshman. And he looked at his dad and he said, are, are you going to give me that money that you saved? And his dad said, no way. <laughs> Congratulations on your 31 credits. Oh, another one final uh, thing that was established, and okay. it's been about 20 years now, is the Barbara G. Doster Positive Attitude Award. And this spring of 2010, 2010, 14 awards were given for the positive attitude, and the students received $500. It's right. Our sons and daughters, particularly our sons, gave money to establish this along with the School of Management Council back yeah. 20 years ago. Very nice. And the thing that I appreciated, and this was the students' idea, of course, was positive attitude. They recognized that I had a positive attitude about them. And rather than honor the president of the this or the great athlete of that, just a normal student who in class was positive or got the team together, had some positive words to say to his neighbor that helped right. that neighbor understand that class. Right. So. Good. I wanted to be sure and mention that. Um, how about an outstanding event? And you've got one of those? The Leadership okay. Forum. That's great. It is the outstanding right. event. And you go every year? Every year, and okay. I'm asked to make the opening good. speech, and I didn't. The first year I went, I didn't know I was going to be doing that, so <laughs> <laughs> I thought quickly and stood up. I can do it, right. <laughs> I how can about, do it. How about your Purdue tradition? Any tradition that uh, you have that you'd like to share with us? There's so much at Purdue. Uh, I like the way Purdue honors its students. Uh, In course, so many ways. Yeah, right. not only grade-wise, right. but for th other things And they this do. is a good example of that positive, that award. That's very nice. And yes. you make an impact. It means a lot. And it does a lot for the individuals. Yes, and it's nice then to receive the notes from the students right, who, exactly. who right. thank me afterwards. Now, the final thing is retirement activities. What are you people doing? Well, it seems like our days just go by <laughs> much too quickly. They all, they all <clears throat> say that, don't they? I'm on the um, Mortar Board Alumni Council at Ohio State. Oh, are you? And okay. I've been secretary. This is my fourth year. I, I that think keeps maybe. You busy. I think maybe you pass that on after a while. And I'm, <clears throat> I do things like the Historical Society in Harveysburg, and I'm in the Warren County Arts Council. We just had our arts festival in the end of June. And uh, I'm a PEO, and I haven't connected with the Purdue group, group yet in Dayton, but we're on their list, and so <laughs> we get their emails. That's great. And they're very enthusiastic. So That's I good. like you know, I like that about Purdue. Right. I know it was said about Ohio State, but it's true also of Purdue. Right. You go to a university like this and there are four or five hundred thousand alums. Right, exactly. And that's a plus. I'm going to let you, something that I forgot to ask, or I'll let you make some comments, or if your husband has anything special, we're going to get him sometime, but anything in closing that you thought that I might have missed. Like I, think, I think you, you've done just a wonderful job. There was something at the end of my remarks. Okay, that's good. That, uh, you like to share with us? Yes. Uh, professionally, after child raising, I used the skills I'd practiced beginning at North to become an advisor, director of undergrad programs in the School of Management, establishing the Academic Advising Association at Purdue, and my students organized and continue to sponsor the 
Leadership Forum and the Positive Attitude Award. And lastly, this sentence, self-worth is learned, and it underlies my actions. And I've learned it through these 76 years that I've been on this earth. And today I am still part of several things. Uh, one I'm most proud of is my friend Jim Coronas has started Operation Buckeye. Five years ago they sent 94 boxes to the troops in Afghanistan and Iraq. They're up to 15,000 and we're fortunate enough to contribute <laughs> and I want to get up there and take the grandchildren to pack boxes That's so they great. know what it's like. That's great. It's, it's an amazing thing. That's They're great. starting an Ohio State chapter. We may be over to Purdue. To start <laughs> <a chapter>. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Barbara. I want to oh, thank you very much. You're thank welcome.